Okay, grace and greet. Titus 3.15. All who are with me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Greet Grace be with you all. So the importance of greetings. Romans 16.16. 16, greet one another. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16.20. All the brothers and sisters here send greetings. Greet one another. 2 Corinthians 13.12. Greet one another. Uh, 1 Peter 5.14. Greet one another. It wasn't just a Paul thing. It was a Peter thing. It was an apostle thing. It was a Christian thing. It was something constantly they're saying, greet one another, greet one another, greet one another, greet one another. Um, People don't come to your church looking for a friendly preacher. If the preacher's friendly, that's good. I mean, if you don't have a friendly preacher, that's going to be bad for your church. But people don't come there just looking for a friendly preacher. He's paid to be friendly, right? That's the way they're going to look at it. It's his job to be friendly. Customer service. They're not going and looking for just a friendly preacher. They're going and looking for a friendly church. Have you ever been somewhere and you see somebody that you care about or like and you're like hey maybe it happened to you in high school or something and they blow you off and they don't respond with excitement to see you and you're like oh i guess they don't like me as much as i like them or have you ever been in a situation where you have you're somewhere and you haven't seen somebody a while and they're like hey um you know i've been in situations where I see people and they turn to see me, their eyes light up and they're like, hey! And they gregariously greet you. Those kind of people you like. Those are the kind of people you want to be around. Those are the kind of people who are going to have influence on you because they're friendly. Dad always used to say, if you want to make friends, be friendly. And if we greet each other and greet strangers... Don't sit there. If somebody comes into church and you don't, you're like, I wonder who that person is. Go find out. Go up to them. Greet them. Engage them. Say somebody comes to church and you do know who they are. Go greet them. Stop just coming in, sitting and watching the show and leaving. Build relationship and community and family. That's what we're supposed to have. We're devoted to fellowship. And you can't be devoted to fellowship by hiding in a corner and not being friendly. The Bible commands this again and again and again. So Paul is always greet this person, greet that person. They send all these greetings. Greetings are actually important. A good handshake, a good hello. And COVID's made this all weird because we're afraid to touch each other. And now we, you know, greet each other with a holy fist bump or whatever with the COVID elbow thing. I don't know what we're doing. But uh, whatever, do, you know, do something um, the, some people are, are huggers. Now, when I go to Mexico, I am hugged. It's their culture to hug. In fact, I would joke with Annie about it. I was like, there's a whole hugging schedule. There's, uh, I had to learn a different cultural protocol because I was coming across as a rude American because I wasn't running up to everybody and throwing my arms around them because I'm a rude American. And, um, and, and I'm not, I wasn't raised as a hugger of people. I've had to learn but, and, and let's, let's face it, there are some people who make hugs weird, right? They're all like, mm, they're like, oh, uh, you know, <laughs> I've been comfortable. So let me just say, the Bible says to greet each other with a holy kiss. That would be where guys kissed guys and girls kissed girls, and it was on the cheek, okay? So it wasn't an unholy kiss. It was a holy kiss. So greet each other with a holy hug, make it a side hug, okay? Let's just, let's just affirm with the side hug rather than the frontal hug. It's, it's weird. Okay, you're creepy if you're doing that. Just, you know, a good side hug, okay? Or greet each other with a holy handshake or whatever. But greet each other in a way, uh, with kids, you've got to be careful today because there's so much molestation and weird, evil stuff in this world and you don't want to be accused of something weird. But kids especially respond to uh, affection. And so it's not wrong to give the little side hug to the kid or to tussle their hair or, or whatever. Um, kids thrive off affection. And if you will pay attention and greet a kid, don't just greet the parents. Greet the kids. Then this kid's going to like coming to church. Kids going to feel valued. Because a lot of kids go around and get totally ignored. And I used to have this weird thing where strange kids that I did not know would come up and start talking to me randomly. And people around me would comment on it. Why are these kids 
always, what, you're like the Pied Piper. That's what my dad used to say. The kids are just like drawn to you. And I've, I thought about it and I realized what it is, is I acknowledge kids. I would talk to them. I look at them. I smile at them. Just looking at people and smiling at people uh, goes a long way. But there needs to be a greeting of one another and an excitement to see each other. And if you say to somebody, hey, how you been? Listen for the answer. Do not be the those, hey, how you doing? Before you can answer, run, you know, run. But, and we don't want to be weird greeters at church that are, uh, you know, making things awkward. Like, if you want to be ignored in life, you really want to be ignored, get a clipboard and walk around in a mall. <laughs> you know, people avoid you like the plague. <laughs> you ever see those people with the clipboards that come up, hey, can I ask you a question? They're trying to sell something, right? And you're in the mall, you're just like, I'm just trying to shop. No, thank you. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like, I remember we, go through, we were going through the mall, me and Kaylee were together, and she was like, don't make eye contact. Don't make eye contact. <laughs> so if you should make eye contact when you want to ignore somebody, when people come into your church, what should you do? You should make eye contact. You should smile. You should greet them. Be friendly. It's important to greet one another. And who, those who love us in the faith, look at Ephesians. Peace to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. What binds us together? I mean, what do we have in common? What do I have in common with Earl? You know, no, not much. You know, different generation, different age, likes different music, probably into different things. He's probably a Ford man. See? And what am I driving? See? We, but what do we got in common? We got Jesus in common. We got a love for Christ. So he's a brother. And, so, and, um, and he's funny. And so he's fun to be around. Uh, always happy to see me. Always happy to see him and uh, the, the Iron Maiden that he punches the holes with. And um, the uh, <coughs> old iron signs. That's right. That's what he calls it. Old iron signs. <coughs> Looked like a torture device to me. <laughs> But that, that whole greeting one another, creating fellowship, creating relationship, and all of a sudden you, um, you have a family around you, people of different ages, different backgrounds, different views, um, and you build that kind of community and family that's not just your age group, your little group, that, and you can build an actual family. The Bible says uh, that God puts the brokenhearted and the lonely into families. And that's what should happen in the church. Brokenhearted, lonely, hurting people should come here and be placed in a family. And that doesn't happen if we ignore one another and lie to each other every Sunday. How you doing? Oh, great. Good. Lie. When stuff's going bad, we don't tell each other and we don't ask for prayer for one another. We don't share with one another. There needs to be a development of relationship maybe that can't happen on sunday morning because it's too quick or it, it's not long enough maybe you need to be in a home bible study maybe you need to get involved in a, in a in a sunday school group maybe you need to get involved in a men's fellowship or a women's fellowship maybe you need to get involved in something so we don't have that at our church maybe you need to start one uh, so that you can build the kind of relationship that we have this peace and brotherhood with people who share the love of Christ and who share our faith. And there's not enough of that going on today. So that is Titus. Titus is done. Hallelujah. What time do I got? All right. 6.54. I got a good time. Let's start into 2 Timothy. Now I put 2 Timothy uh, at the end. I didn't do 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and then Titus. And the reason is, is because 2 Timothy was written after Titus. So I decided to address the books in chronological order, not necessarily the order with which they're placed in the New Testament. Um, this book is the last letter Paul writes. I believe he wrote Hebrews even before this. Um, th this is at the very end. So we're talking late, f you know, 50s, A.D. And this is at the end of his ministry. And he's going to refer to some things here 
just like with Titus that maybe weren't mentioned in Acts because Paul's ministry went on a good little bit. He, he got out of jail for that first time in Rome and then he does some trips and then he comes back and ends up in jail again. And so in this, Paul is writing to Timothy because he's in a tight spot. And he's in a bad situation. Isn't it funny how a guy like Paul sacrificed and served, discipled and trained, led all these leaders, planted all these churches, and at the end, he's practically alone. Worked his whole life, and what did he get for it? Deserted, abandoned, and beheaded. But his reward wasn't here. It was in heaven. It's in heaven. And his reward is still coming. He hasn't been raised from the dead yet. And the consequences of his ministry were not felt mostly in his life, but in fact after. Because all of us have been touched, encouraged, educated, inspired by his writings. And much of Paul's ministry was actually from those times when he was in jail and he got bored and he wrote letters. And a big part of his, in fact, the biggest part of his ministry was after he was dead. Isn't that weird? That the people he trained and also the letters he left behind are what really made the huge impact from his ministry. And if he would have taken the sum total of what was going on at the end of his life here, it could have been discouraging. But sometimes we're looking at a moment in history, we're not looking at the big picture of what God's going to do with the seeds we planted, with the men that we trained, with the things we wrote and taught. Okay? So... Here's what Paul writes. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus. So the relationship uh, to Christ and Timothy is what he refers to in this opening. Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus. So the first thing he's pointing out is, who am I? And what is my relationship to Christ? So when Paul is setting up who the letter is from and his authority in talking to this young man, he sets it up, first of all, what's my relationship to God? Well, I am an apostle called by the will of Christ. Jesus Christ himself chose me and sent me to be his messenger. I am an inspired apostle of Christ. And that's the same kind of things he has to do in other books, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and, and the other things we've already covered earlier in this class I showed you the many times Paul defends his apostleship right from the start he does it in this letter as well because he knew not just Timothy was going to read this he knew that other people would read it too and so he needed to defend his authority as an apostle then he uh, talks to Timothy and look what look what he says in first Timothy to my true child in the faith grace mercy and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ so to my dear son so one, he's calling him dear son. The other, he's calling him true child. What do you mean by true child? Was he a biological son of Paul? No, he's saying there's a truer kind of son than that. Um, I know someone who refers to their biological father by his first name and calls their stepdad dad. Because the biological father abandoned the person, left them when they were a child, turned over custody, and, and has not seen them since. But the stepdad came in and took over and loved the child, raised them, and has been a grandfather to their kids and so on. And so the true father is not the biological person. It's the person who 
They emulate and act like, just like we're the true children of Abraham. Not a physical descent, but a faith. And Paul is saying, you're my true child in the faith. You're my dear son. And so <clears throat> he appeals to his relationship to God and his relationship to the individual. If you want to connect someone to Christ, then you connect yourself to God with them and connect yourself to them in a strong bond. And then something in psychology happens. If I had a little board, I'd write it on there. But you draw a period, and I learned this in psychology class. You draw a pyramid, and, and it's true with anybody. Uh, say the person up here, you know, Bill is friends with Joe, and Joe is friends with Jack. If Bill and Jack can't be friends, Jack and Joe can't be friends. Something happens where all three have to connect or it'll break the other one. And when you um, have a relationship with someone and a relation, this tight relationship with God, they have to connect to God eventually or it'll break your relationship with them. And that's just how it is. You have to choose between uh, Christ and your relationship with Him and your relationship with others at times. There have been some men and women who've had to choose God and lost their spouse over it. They had to choose God and lost a relationship with their parents over it. Lost a relationship with someone because they chose to have this. And then there's others because they had this strong relationship with God and they tried to maintain this relationship with the parent. The parent then or the, the spouse or the friend connects to Christ. And a cord of three strands is not easily broken. And it creates a strong bond that happens. When a, a godly a uh, parent introduces their child to God and they get a relationship with God and God is in the middle of this parent. It's a strong, unbelievable bond. When a husband and wife both draw close to Christ and put Him in and He will wrap around and bond them together. And, and there are many marriages that never know the true intimacy of what their marriage could be because God's not in the center of it. And Paul here is showing how I've got this relationship to Christ and I've got this relationship to you. And that's why I want to encourage you, young Timothy, my son, my true son, my dear son, in your relationship with Christ and your walk with Him so that bond between you and He is never broken. And that's what this letter is doing. He's connecting the dots of relationally at the beginning when he gives the address of who wrote it and who it's written to. Verse 3. I thank God whom I serve as my ancestors did with a clear conscience as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers recalling your tears. I long to see you so that you may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice and am now persuaded lives in you also. So Paul starts off with a very personal letter. I think this is probably the most personal of the three letters that we're studying. Very personal. Well, what's he say? First of all, he says he serves God with a clear conscience. Acts 23.1 Looking intently at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. He said, well, how can you say that? Paul used to kill Christians. <laughs> he thought he was right. He thought he was doing the right thing when he killed Christians. Now God showed him different. God appeared on the road to Damascus and showed him that he was the Christ and showed him that that's not true. And when he found out he was wrong, what did he do? Keep sinning? Pridefully deny it? Rebelliously obey Christ? No, what did he do? He changed his tune. He repented. And he became a Christian. And he went from the one who was tearing down and destroying the church to being one of its greatest builders. Because when he saw 
that he was wrong, and his conscience was pricked, he changed. See, the problem with some of us is the Holy Spirit comes to us through the Word, through a preacher, through a sermon, through a scripture, convicts us, shows us we're wrong, and we're so proud and arrogant we won't admit, yeah, I guess I was wrong. I mean, really, really, really wrong. And we keep persisting in our wrong because of our pride. And we don't follow our conscience. Now, deep down we know, oh boy, I'm off. But we hold on because that's what mom taught me, or that's what dad taught me, or that's what my favorite teacher Gamaliel taught me. Or that's not how I was trained at Bible college, or that's not how I grew up in my church, or that wasn't our denominational history. And the Word of God will be as plain as the nose on their face, and they'll just act like it's not there. And they won't listen, because they don't follow their conscience. And one of the things that Paul did is he served God with a clear conscience. So he always take pains to have a clear conscience towards both God and man, Acts 24. The way he uh, lived his life, not only would he not steal from God and not take money, when he was going to deliver money to Jerusalem, he had other people come along and actually carry the money and be in charge of the money so he could never be accused of swiping people's financial gifts for himself. Because he not only wanted to do what was honest before God he, and right before God, he wanted to do what was right in the eyes of everybody. You, you don't want to just not put yourself in a situation where you, you would have an affair. You don't want you wanted to be put in a situation where it looked like you had an affair. You know, people really make fun of Mike Pence uh, because he, he had this rule he wouldn't meet with a woman that's not his wife and have dinner alone with him. And they all were mocking him and stuff. I admire him. I admire that. I'd sure rather have somebody err on the side of caution than have another Bill Clinton doing unseemly things in the Oval Office. I'll take Pence over Clinton any day. And he not only was doing what to be faithful to his wife, he was doing it in a way that he couldn't even be accused. Did you guys know that when Billy Graham uh, came into stay at a hotel into a town he had to send his team of workers in first and clear his room because they would constantly go in and there would be a naked woman in his bed and a reporter sitting there hiding behind a curtain ready to take a picture because people were trying to set him up to get a picture of Billy Graham with a prostitute in his hotel room because they wanted something salacious to put in their Inquirer magazine or something that kind of stuff is insane. But you have to not only do what's right, you have to do, you have to think about how it looks. And Paul was a man who wanted a clean, clear conscience towards God and others. And if you're walking around with a dirty conscience, uncleansed by the blood and the forgiveness of Jesus, and di dirty because you're doing things you know is wrong, you're not going to be able to prosper and go to the next level of your relationship with God. In fact, I don't even know if you're going to be able to completely maintain your relationship with God. We can't live in sin. We might stumble and fall, but we can't stay there. We've got to get up, wash off our bloody knees, and start running again. We can't wallow in defeat. And we need to have this clear conscience. Look at 1 Timothy 1.5. The aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. You see, we always talk about, well, we all need to love people. We just need to love people. We need to love others. We need, to, we need more of the love of Jesus. We need love, love, love. love. Where, well, where does that come from? Love comes from where? Real love. A pure heart and a good conscience. And a sincere, a real, true faith. And there's too many people faking it. There's too many people halfway doing it. There's too many people duplistically living. Giving lip service to Jesus and then not following their conscience on Monday through Saturday. Paul says it takes effort and I am striving 
to live with a clean conscience. If your conscience isn't clean, ask for forgiveness, get forgiveness, and change your ways. Repent. We got to be seeking this clear conscience. And he says, I'm constantly praying for you. Look at Thessalonians. As we pray most earnestly night and day that we may see you face to face and supply what's lacking in your faith. Notice, when was Paul praying? Night and day. He was constantly praying for people. For the churches, for the people that he loved, for the people that he cared about, for the people he'd, he'd converted, for the teachers he'd discipled. He was constantly praying. And he was regularly praying for Timothy. Why? Because Timothy's his dear son, his true son in the faith. Ephesians 1.16 I do not cease to give thanks for you remembering you in my prayers. Say, well, I don't know what to pray for them. I think everything's going good in their life. Well, then give thanks for them. We need to be regularly praying for needs, yes, but we also need to be giving thanks. That's one of the things that you look at prayer lists in churches. It's a list of who's sick. And there's not spiritual needs being addressed. But even worse is, there should be a list of things we're thankful for. You know? we're, We're richly thankful. We need to not ever stop thanking God for the people who've made a difference in our life, for the people that God's blessed us with, for the blessings that God has given us. We need to count our blessings, name them one by one. And count the many blessings to see what God has done. We need to be constantly, regularly praying for people, giving thanks. And that creates an emotional connection. Paul had an emotional connection with Timothy. When he left Timothy and they parted, Timothy cried. Because they had created a bond. One of my dad's greatest ministries was not preaching. Well, was his writing? Well, yeah. Or is, it, is the students he trained? Well, okay. But you know what I think one of my dad's greatest ministries was? He was available. Anyone, uh, he had hundreds of students. And he spent a good portion of his day, especially in the latter years of his life, on the phone. This preacher called here. I got this Bible question, George. And they talk about his life. And, this, and all these preachers and all these men, he came to their things. He told his silly jokes. He preached his sermons. He did his revivals. But when they called him up, they had a problem in the church. They had a thing. He gave them advice. Oh, I wrote an article on that. Here. And, and he, he listened to them and he cared about them. And I don't care if you were at a church of 50 or you are a church of 5,000. He would give you equal time and access. And when dad died, I have never seen so many grown men cry in my life. There was a line when people walked out of dozens and dozens of men, preachers, bawling their eyes out. Because they knew they weren't going to see him for a while. The thing I miss most is being able to call my dad and have access and you think, well, yeah, well, you were a son. <laughs> Everybody had access. There wasn't another Bible college president that w- answers the phone himself. And he created emotional connections with people. I, I want to learn to do that. You know, There's an old saying. People won't remember everything you've said, but they'll remember how you made them feel. They'll remember some of what you said, but they're going to remember whether you valued them. Paul valued Timothy. Dear son. True son. And when Paul left, And they parted ways after he was traveling with them. They parted ways. He cried. Because he didn't know if he'd ever see him alive again. He lived a dangerous life. Both of them did. They were in a lot of peril. It was hard times. Imagine 
Maybe some of you went through this. You send your child off to a theater of war. They're going to be deployed, and not just deployed, but deployed into a war zone. There's going to be some tears. There's going to be some difficulty. For God is my witness how I yearn for you with the affection of Christ. Paul writes to the church at Philippi. Why did Paul have such a connection to Philippi? When he first got there, the jailer who started the church beat the tar out of him. Why do you have such affection? Because they were the lone church that sent him financial support and supported his ministry. You think when Paul didn't know where the next meal was going to come from and somebody from Philippi showed up with a bag of gold or silver coins saying, Here, here's our monthly support. You think he didn't praise God and thank him? You think they weren't in his heart? When they kept him going? When they supported him? When they were praying for him? Yeah, there was an affection because they were partners in the ministry. That's one of my big complaints about missionaries today is churches will send $50 a month to 400 missionaries. <laughs> you know, they have all these missions they want to support and they give a little bit to everybody and they don't ever get a connection. The missionary doesn't come back and spend enough time. What if you took your mission budget and you stopped giving little teeny tiny amounts to 30 missions and you boil it down to two, three missions and gave them thousands of dollars? Now you have influence over them. Now if they start straying doctrinally, you can hold them accountable. Now, when they come back to the United States, they're going to spend some time with you and get to know you. And now you can build relationship and send some of your people over there and you can build connection. Because you build these relationships. Paul had this relationship and they were emotionally connected. You can't emotionally connect everyone. Jesus had 12 apostles and he couldn't emotionally connect all of them. He, he had to focus more on three of them than the rest of the, the 12. Because you just can't be best friends with everyone. And so, there are some people though, you need to develop this emotional connection with. For their sake and for yours. Look at John. So also you have Sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy from you. When they were hurting because of his departure, because he wasn't with him, he was able to comfort them with the fact that someday we will be rejoined. How is it I face the death of my father without absolute bitterness and, and torment? Because... We'll meet again. When I was a kid, I was ripped away from my dad and I didn't see him for long periods of time and there'd be big time periods between and maybe it was something that I just learned as a kid. Sometimes dad's not there, but he'll be back. See him again. And I have no doubt that the day will come when I get to see dad again. that emotional connection can create sorrow, but it can also give hope. It's a powerful and important thing. And we need to be connected to people, our fellow Christians, so that we can pass on the faith. Notice he said, the faith that you have that once lived in your grandma, Lois, and then your mother, Eunice, and I'm now convinced, lives in you. So he appeals to a faith that is his heritage. Now his dad was a Greek. Wasn't a Christian. But his grandma and his mom were. From childhood, you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith. Paul wasn't there in his childhood. Who taught him in his childhood the sacred writings? Lois and Eunice. If dad's not there to do it, mom, grandma, step up. 
I know it's the dad's responsibility initially, but if the dad's not a Christian, the dad's not doing it, grandma and grandpa, mom, pick up. Church members, see that kid who wouldn't be in taught? Take him under your wing and teach him yourself. He had the faith passed on to him. Deuteronomy, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, and when you lie down, and when you get up. <laughs> this was my dad's favorite verse on parenting. He lived this verse. He didn't have, all right, time for family devotions. And everybody goes, oh. That's not the way he did it. He would impress them on us. He'd talk about them when we were sitting around at home. Hey, son, come here. What? I got this verse. Now, it could mean this or it could mean that. Which do you think it means? He'd ask my opinion. Make me think about it. Teach me critical thinking. Hey, son, I got a game for you. What? I'm going to preach my sermon. Yeah. And if you can reproduce my outline from my sermon accurately and give me back my outline, I'll, I'll buy you a present. You get a prize. It was harder than I thought. <laughs> he did that with my brothers too. Taught us to outline. I'm talking 10 years old. I thought it was just playing a fun game with my dad. I didn't know I was being indoctrinated. <laughs> talk about him when you sit at home. He would sit and talk about stuff. He got to the point where he always laughed because he would be, I was very blessed because dad got to meet all these famous preachers. We'd go to Hillsboro. And we go out to this restaurant they used to have in Hillsboro called the Wooden Spoon. And we'd go to the Wooden Spoon and sit at the Wooden Spoon and there'd be Ed Bowsman and Clarence Greenleaf and, uh, you know, all these famous preachers sitting there, you know, uh, sitting around talking with my dad. And they'd start talking about theology. You know, there's, you know, Roger Chambers who's like, like IQ 150 or something. And they're all... <laughs> <coughs> sit around and talk and I was so used to dad letting me butt in I would like make comments and they'll be all like <laughs> um, and I got to I got to be a, because we were sitting around and talk about stuff he included me in it he didn't say hey go play your video game be quiet leave me alone and I would ask dumb questions and he'd answer them and he wasn't annoyed by it he saw that when we're sitting around at home talking that was fun and when we walk along the road <coughs> now, i got to be honest, me and my dad didn't do a lot of walking along the road, but we rode a lot of places in Cadillacs. And if he didn't have his gospel music cranked out the roof as we bounced along, you know, then we would be, and he would sit and talk about stuff, and we'd listen to sermons and listen to tapes and listen to other people preach. I don't know how many sermons I was force-fed, didn't even realize it, you know, driving along, floating down the road, going somewhere in dad's Cadillac. So while we sat around the house, when we went down the road, when we'd lie down at night, he'd tell me Bible stories while he rubbed my back. And, you know, a kid will listen to anything if you rub their back. And when you get up, he'd get up and quote Scripture. That's how you do it. You want to you disciple a kid? That's the secret. That's the kind of thing uh, Lois and Eunice were doing. From his youth, Timothy was taught the Scriptures. They had faith. Grandma had the faith. Mama had the faith. Son got the faith. Why? Because from youth, they taught the Scriptures. When should you teach it? How should you teach it? Oh, when you're sitting around the house. We'd watch a movie. And Dad would go, no, no. Who's the Christ figure in this? I'm like, what? Who's the person who sacrifices themselves? And he'd draw a close, or something happened in, in, a, in a movie and he'd make some parallel. How that could be like a sermon illustration. He taught me to sermonize everything. Everything was fair game to be a sermon illustration or to help understand a point. Constantly, everything we're involved in was always going back to God. As we sat, as we went down the road, as we lie down, as we got up. And that's how you do it. That's how you teach a kid. 
just casually like you do anything else that you're interested in. And that's passing on the faith. And then he says, for this reason, because your mom and your grandma passed their faith on to you, for this reason, I remind you to fan the flame of the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now we learned in the last book that he had the laying on of hands from the elders to make him an evangelist. But this is the gift. What gift? What gift came by the laying on of Paul's hands? Well, what, what a gift could the apostles give with the apostles laying on a hand? The Holy Spirit, that's right. Look what it says. For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid. So what's, he, what's the gift that came by the laying on of his hands? I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that came in his baptism. I'm talking about the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit that came on him so that he had the ability to speak in tongues and to prophesy and to do miracles. That, that there's a difference between the Holy Spirit coming upon you where you do miracles and the Holy Spirit coming in you where he dwells in you. The latter of those is the better, by the way. Um, he did not give us a spirit that makes us timid, but give us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about your Lord and of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Okay, let's break that down. First of all, fan the flame. Look what it says about flame and the Holy Spirit in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 through 22. Do not quench the Spirit. How do you do that? How do you, how do you quench the Spirit? Do not treat the prophecies with contempt. But test them all and hold what is good and reject every kind of evil. You can quench the Holy Spirit by not listening to the prophetic word of God, i.e. the New Testament. You want to quench the Holy Spirit? Then uh, treat, the, treat the New Testament with contempt. Because what the prophets in this day that he's talking about here were writing down is what you have in your Bible. That's the 27 books of the New Testament you have. And the way to quench the Holy Spirit is to treat the scriptures with contempt to treat the prophecy coming from inspired apostles and prophets with contempt and he says fan the flame in you don't quench the holy spirit's word i gave you the ability to prophesy timothy fan that flame don't quench that flame and god gave you the prophetic writings of these apostles and prophets he gave you the prophecy, the faith once and for all delivered to the saints, as Jude, sa Jude says. Do not treat it with contempt. That will quench the Holy Spirit. You can put out the Spirit's fire in your life. Remember uh, when it talks about the, the Spirit and the, the, the lampstands in Revelation? What did he say would happen to the church if they didn't repent? He'd remove their what? He'd remove their lampstand. The fire of the Spirit in a church can go out. The fire of the Spirit in a person can go out. The Holy Spirit can leave you. The Holy Spirit used to come upon Samson and he'd do all these miraculous things and had all this strength. But when he finally broke the last of God's commands for the Nazarite, he touched something dead, he drank the wine, and then he finally did the last one, which was what? Cut his hair. It says he got up, tried to shake the Philistines off as he always did before, and he didn't realize what? The Holy Spirit had left him. What a terrible thing for the Holy Spirit to pick up and leave and you don't even know because you're treating God's word with such contempt. Now, good old Samson repented before the end and uh, he had one more show to do and he brought down the house. Um, but... Um, you want to fan that flame of God's will. You don't want to quench the Spirit and what the Holy Spirit's telling you. That's a dangerous game. 
Um, but there are different kinds of gifts. Now, I mentioned it, and now I kind of want to prove it, okay? 1 Timothy 4.14. 4, Do not neglect the gift you have given, which is given by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. So in 1 Timothy, there's one time when the elders laid hands on him. We know Paul was not one of those elders, and he's not talking about himself there. Then there's the other time when Paul lays hands on him and gives him the miraculous gift of the Spirit. You say, well, Kendall, how do we know that the apostles would give the miraculous gifts um, by the laying on of their hands? Well, Acts 8, 17 and 18 tells us this. When they laid their hands on him, and the they there is uh, James and John, when they laid their hands on them, and the them there is the the Christians in Samaria, they received the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw the Spirit was given through the laying on of hands of the apostles, he offered them money. Hey, give me that ability so I can dole out the Holy Spirit to people. Now, why did Simon want that gift? For financial reasons. He was a sorcerer, and he used to have people come to him, and they would pay him, and he would do his spell. He was a snake oil salesman of all kinds. He was a trickster. And now he sees real power and real ability. And he's like, oh, give me that, give me that. Because that, he was seeing it as a money-making opportunity. And so what's Peter say? May your money perish with you. He, he wouldn't do it. But I want you to see that the miraculous gifts were given through the laying on of hands of the apostles. We know the Holy Spirit came in you, according to Acts 2.38, when you're baptized. That's when you see the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. But don't confuse the gift of the Spirit, where the Spirit is the gift given inside of you, and the gifts of the Spirit, where the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you can do miraculous things. They received at their baptism. These Christians, the them there in verse 17, they were already baptized. Philip already baptized. They already had the Holy Spirit in them. But they didn't have the miraculous gifts. Now, they didn't have a New Testament with 27 books. It hadn't been written yet. So how were they going to know doctrine? Each church had to have a prophet. So back then, you needed prophets and you needed people who could speak in tongues and do miraculous signs to prove that they were speaking for God. And your ability to speak in a language you never learned or to heal somebody with a sickness or to <coughs> accurately foretell the future was proof, uh, what the Bible calls a sign and uh, an evidence that you were speaking for God. And then when you spoke doctrine, everyone could know it's true. He can speak in languages he never learned. He can heal the sick and he can predict the future. So we know when he says doctrine, it's right. And so Timothy was given that gift by the laying on of Paul's hands. So Timothy had two ordinations. One, as an evangelist, by the elders. One, as a prophet, by the apostle Paul. And, those, and people come to me today and goes, yeah, I'm a prophet. Really? Which apostle laid hands on you? How old are you? You got to be pretty old. See, what we learned in 1 Corinthians 13 is the gift of prophecy, the gift of tongues, and the gift of foreknowledge are going to pass away when the perfect comes and is complete. And that's talking about the scripture. Some people say, no, the perfect that's coming is Jesus. No, that can't be because the word for perfect there is in the Greek ending on the word is for a thing, not a person, number one. And number two, it says that, that when the perfect comes, these tongues are going to pass away, but these three things are going to continue, faith, hope, and love. And we know that hope and faith are going to disappear when Jesus comes back. I, right now, I'm walking by faith and not by... But when Jesus comes back, I'm going to see him. So I won't be walking by faith anymore. Because I'll see him. And right now, the hope of Christianity is the return of Jesus Christ and my resurrection. That's the one hope. And we already, we've already established that in this class, what the one hope is. It's the resurrection of our bodies at the return of Jesus Christ. Well, when Jesus comes back, that's going to be fulfilled. So I'm not going to have hope of eternal life in heaven. I'm going to have it. I'm going to have faith in a God I didn't see. I'm going to see him. That's why faith, hope, and love continuing means that whatever the perfect is that comes has to be before Jesus comes back. Because only when Jesus comes back can faith, hope, and love continue. So what it's saying is before Jesus comes back, something is going to come that's perfect that's going to replace prophecy, foreknowledge, and speaking in tongues. What is it? It's the 27 books of the New Testament that those prophets, tongue speakers, and foretellers gave us. And in it they foretell the future, i.e. the book of Revelation. They speak in tongues and languages they never learned. Read about it in the book of Acts. 
and they give prophecies and they write down scripture and we know what they wrote is true and from God because they had the ability to heal and do the miracles. They had the signs and the wonders that accompanied and confirmed their authority from God. And the people who had that couldn't give it. Now, um, Philip, who started the revival in Samaria, he had the ability to do those things. But he couldn't pass it on. He could get it from the apostles, but he didn't have the ability to give it. Only the apostles could give it. And Timothy couldn't pass it on, but Paul gave it to him because he was one of the apostles of Christ. And by the way, that's one of the biggest proofs. Um, And Paul even uses that in his defense as an apostle. He says, the signs of an apostle are wrought in me. I've got the same abilities to pass on the gifts that the other 11 have. That's how you know I'm a real apostle. Because the signs of an apostle are wrought in me. And so this is how we know that there's different kinds of uh, ordinations, okay? So evangelists are ordained as evangelists. Elders are ordained as elders. Deacons are ordained as deacons. And prophets were ordained as prophets. Okay? Um, So we're going to take our break right here and come back uh, and talk about timidity. Okay, here we go. We are talking about Timothy, and it's said there that uh, the Holy Spirit does not give us a spirit of timidity. Now, I'm a little embarrassed. It's confession time with Kendall. Because I've heard I don't know how many preachers say, and I have said myself, that the word Timothy is uh, at the core of the meaning of his name has the idea of timid. And Paul was making a play on words here that Timothy meant timid and not to be. And I've heard this taught. I've said it myself. I'm embarrassed that I said it because I was completely wrong. And this is why, my friends, when we're taught something, we should always go back ourselves and double check. Um, You know, uh, I know there's a lot of fact checkers that are actually not sharing facts they're trying to cover up facts by fact checking and it's a form of political spin and so but there's some things like the meaning of words that you can actually look up fairly easy and so wanting to show you guys that his name meant timid and that paul was making a play in words what i'd been taught in college and i've heard probably a dozen different preachers say at different times (coughs) i was going to look up the actual greek word for you to be thorough and collegiate Uh, and then I realized I'd been told wrong and I'd been telling people wrong. And this is a good example. There's many things over the years where I've been taught stuff and I have to go back and say, sorry, uh, I was wrong. This is why we should, you know, the Apostle Paul, when he taught the Scriptures, they went back and and, uh, in Berea and they searched the Scriptures to make sure what Paul was saying was correct. And when your preacher tells you something, you should look into it. Now this turns out it's not a big deal. It's not a theological thing. Nobody was going to hell because they misunderstood. But it makes you look like a fool when you get up and teach it yourself. And you've been teaching it wrong and somebody who knows Greek or somebody goes back and checks it and you look. So I looked it up and Timothy is a mix of Timo and Theos, which Timo is to honor and Theos is the word for God. And so Timothy means to honor God. So there's no connection to the word, the word timid and the word Timothy, except in somebody's mind somewhere who thought, those sound alike. I wonder if they're related. They're not. <coughs> All right. Um, power, love, and self-discipline. That's what the Holy Spirit gives. Power, love, and self-discipline. Look at Galatians. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. That's what the Holy Spirit produces in you. If somebody is impatient and they won't suffer long and they're short-tempered and they're angry or they're unloving or they're unkind or they're ungentle, they might have a spirit, but it's just not the Holy One. 
if they're flopping around on the ground like a fish, if they're rolling up and down the aisle, if they get the spirit and start doing laps in the church and jump in the baptistry like the guy I saw in the video the other day, uh, they have a spirit, it's just not the Holy One. The only people I can find in the Bible who flop around on the ground where the spirit is the guys that are demon possessed. And when Jesus casts the demon out, they gain control. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the control of the prophet. The Holy Spirit never puts you on autopilot. You're never going along like Robert Tilton, the big con artist on television, where you're just talking along and you're just talking all of a sudden, oh, the Lord just told me that I came over me. I couldn't control myself. Well, then that wasn't the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gives you self-control. And uh, by the way, don't ever watch the videos where they take Robert Tilton when stuff comes over him and replace a different sound effect in there. That's a bad... Please don't. So the Holy Spirit gives us power. But He also gives us love. And He also gives us self-control. And this out-of-the-control rage... Anger stuff. Have you ever seen some of these preachers on TV where they just start going off on their church? That is not the Holy Spirit. There's nothing holy about it. And the Holy Spirit produces in us powerful things, loving things, and self-discipline. And, and it, it'll even be peaceful and long-suffering. Okay? Extreme patience is a sign of the Holy Spirit. Control of one's emotions is a sign of the Holy Spirit. Gentleness with idiots is a sign of the Holy Spirit being in you. Joy in a world full of depression, that's evidence of the Holy Spirit. Peace when everybody else is in conflict and division, that's a sign of the Holy Spirit. Love in a world full of hate, that's a sign of the Holy Spirit in you. Not flopping around on the ground like a fish out of water. Or sometimes they remind me of Red Skelton doing his impersonation of bacon cooking in a pan, if you've ever seen that old skit. Do not be ashamed. Now he tells them here, don't be timid, don't be ashamed. It can be hard for a sensitive young person who faces a lot of older people uh, and who faces people who um, make them feel stupid or belittle them or whatever. And Paul's telling the Timothy, this young man, look, don't be ashamed of what you're teaching. I know the older, respected Pharisee people that are full on Jews and you're just half Jew might try to intimidate you. Don't let them. Uh, look what it says in Mark eight thirty eight. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him, the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory of his Father with his holy angels. I don't think you want Jesus to be ashamed of you when he returns. So don't be ashamed of him now. One of the biggest things that keeps people from telling others about Jesus is they're ashamed too, they're embarrassed. Poor we me, I might have to feel awkward for my Savior who died on a cross for me and took a whipping and beating for me. I might have to put myself in a socially awkward situation. You know, look, don't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Luke 9.26 For whoever is ashamed of me and my words of him, the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory. And in his Father's and of the holy angels. Why does he keep bringing the angels into this? Because in every parable, and in every story, it's the angels who come and separate the sheep from the goats, the wheat from the shaft, the wicked from the righteous. On the day of judgment, there's going to be one group of people condemned, cast into hell. There's going to be another group of people forgiven, welcomed into heaven. And who's going to do the separating? The angels. And you don't want Jesus to be ashamed of you. There's another verse that says if you confess Him, He'll confess you. But if you won't confess Him, because you're ashamed, He won't confess you. 
You need to con- be unashamed to confess Jesus Christ. There's too many Christians living in fear. Silenced by their cowardice. And if you read Revelation chapter 21, where it lists the sins that are going to send people to hell because they don't repent of them, it's crazy things, you know, like witchcraft, sorcery, murder, drunkenness, lying. But you know what's right there at the front of the list? Cowards. So don't be ashamed to say what needs to be said. And he's telling Timothy, don't be ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because if you... Because <laughs> if you tell the truth and you stand up for it, you're not ashamed, they're going to make you suffer. Some people are like, it seems like when you do good, you just suffer for it. Yeah, there's the devil. Welcome to the war. There are spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places actively working against you. Mm-hmm. And if you try to do what's right and you try to follow your conscience, the devil will try to give you hell on earth. He will, he will um, make your life at times miserable. Paul's life at times was miserable. He, he says in one of his writings that sometimes he despaired of life. He wished he was dead. He went through all of these hardships. And now after he's been through all that, he's telling his young protege, boy, Don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed to be persecuted. It's embarrassing to be persecuted. It's humiliating. If you stand up for what's true and right today, people on Twitter will gang up on you and tell you you're a bigot and you're evil. If you take a stand against immorality and sins, they'll tell you all kinds of horrible things about you. You think about somebody who tries to live a righteous life, the media will mock them. And someday, if things keep persisting on the road we're on, they're not just going to mock you, they're going to they're throw you in jail or, or persecute you. And we're coming very close to that right now. Someday, what I do is hate speech. <laughs> I don't know how many times I've driven by the jail up there by Grissom on my way to school, and I drive by and I look at the windows of the Grissom jail and I think, wonder what room they'll put me in. Because I'm not going to shut up. We've got to join in the suffering. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. When you suffer for doing what's right, that glorifies God. It's a glory to God to suffer for Him. And to be persecuted for him. If you young people, if they make fun of you at school and they mock you, they did me when I was in high school, that's glory to God. If they fire you from your job, that's glory to God. If they won't talk to you anymore, that's glory to God. If they make say mean things about you on the internet, that's glory to God. Second Timothy two three, join with me in suffering like a good soldier. We'll talk more about that verse. But a good soldier knows when they go to battle it's going to be hard. It's going to be suffering. Nobody riding in these ships and then getting in these little PT boats on whatever, riding out these little things to drop in on D-Day went, oh, this is going to be fun. I can't wait to hit the beach. Spring break. No, nobody was feeling that. They were terrified. And, you know, thousands of them died and ran into it because they loved their country and they knew there was a job that had to be done if the world was going to be free. And there's a job that has to be done if souls are going to be saved. If people in this community are going to be reached, There's some suffering that has to happen. If your family and your kids are going to be saved, if your wife and your children are going to be uh, presented before God faultless and spotless, uh, if the people in your church are going to stand firm to the end, and if your church is going to take a stand in the community, there's got to be some suffering. If you aren't willing to suffer, don't go into ministry. Don't even get baptized. 
Because you're just going to turn on God and abandon Him and betray Him. Don't have a kid if you aren't willing to change diapers. If you aren't willing to sacrifice and pay, don't have a kid. You know? Don't get married if you're not going to be faithful. If you're not going to love that person in sickness and in health. In good times and bad times. If you're not going to go through the suffering, don't get married. And if you're not willing to suffer as a Christian, don't get baptized. Because you're going to suffer. Sometimes extremely painfully. You say, well, why would anybody want to become a Christian if they're just going to... Because, let me tell you, whether you become a Christian or you don't, you're going to suffer. One might be a little sooner, but here's the great thing. The one is a lot shorter. No Christian has ever suffered as long as non-Christians have. Apostle Paul, did he suffer? Extreme. A lot worse than old Nero who took his head, huh? But who's been suffering longer now? Paul suffered 30 years. How long has poor Nero been suffering? Yeah, I think if I'm going to suffer, I want to do the one that's the shortest, right? If you got, I don't know how you guys are, but if, are you one of those weirdos who pulls the band-aid off slow? Not me. Now, like if, when it comes to band-aid, call me Jack. You know, because I'm ripping that thing off there. And then, I don't want to get it over with. And I don't want to suffer forever in hell. Do you? And what's awesome is our suffering makes a difference. What's sad is people fighting for a wicked army in a wicked war are suffering. Russians are suffering right now, soldiers, for nothing. For the greed of a dictator. But there are some soldiers, good soldiers, and a good army defending their nation. They suffer and even give their lives but it was for a cause that they loved. They loved freedom and the protection of their family and the protection of their nation more than their own life. Do you love Jesus more than your own life? Do you love the gospel and the salvation of of sinners like you more than your own life? Which is more important? Your comfort or a stranger's eternal soul? Which is more important to God? When you say, well, why would God allow this discomfort and this pain and this hurt in my heart? Why would God allow these problems in my life? Why would God allow this? You gotta ask yourself, what's more important to God? your short-term comfort or your eternal soul and the eternal souls of other lost people around you. Maybe the reason He's allowing you to suffer is because He's interested in your soul and He's interested in other souls. God's not focused on your short-term comfort. He's focused on your eternal bliss in heaven. He's focused on giving you eternal life and saving you from death. Not fixing little momentary problems that aren't important. But the big picture, that's what God is focused on. And the reason that we join in suffering is we are joining in the ministry of Christ that brings salvation. And so because of this, joining, we join Christ in His glory, we join Christ in His suffering, and we also need to join Christ in His holiness 2 Timothy 1 9 he saved us and called us to a holy life he didn't save you to be an addict he didn't save you to be a drunk 
He didn't save you to be a porn addict. He didn't save you to be a pervert. He didn't save you to be a thief or a liar. He didn't save you to keep sinning. He saved you so you could become holy. He forgave all that stuff so you could repent and start over. He saved you so that you could be the husband you should be, the wife you should be, the grandparent you should be, the child you should be. The Christian, you should be. He saved you to be holy. You're not just some other schmuck on the street. You're not just some other slump. You're not just some other person. You are now a child of God. He saved you to be special and to call other people into this special life. To, be, to not be a normal, everyday Dixie cup you throw away when you're done drinking out of it. To be precious china. He saved you to be a value. More valuable than gold and silver. Of eternal value and worth. You are sacred. Holy. Not because of anything we have done, but because of His own purpose and grace. (laughs) Notice you didn't do anything to earn it. He didn't save you because you were so good. He saved you because you've been really bad. If you've been really good, He wouldn't need to save you. Jesus said, doctor doesn't come for healthy people. He comes for sickos. And he came for us because we were sick. And we needed some healing. But he didn't come so we could stay sick. He came so we could be healed. And that we could live a holy life. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Now when did time begin? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When God threw out the heavens, created space, and put the earth in it, that's when time began. Ironically, that's exactly when Einstein, according to his theory of relativity, says time began. He says that time is created by matter warping space. I'm not smart enough to figure all that E, M, C squared stuff out. But that's what Einstein says too. Before time began, there was a time where there was no time. God is outside of time. And this linear motion of time that we're in was created by God at creation. Before he created it, he had a plan. Jesus knew he was going to the cross before he said, let there be light before he divided the earth and the sea, before he created the plants, before he created the birds and the fish, before he created all the little creeping things on the ground, before he made man and then created woman out of his rib, he had a plan. His grace was given before time began. God knew everything was going to happen. Every variable he understood every action of every molecule he created he knew how it would play out and the intricacies thereof and in advance he made a way of salvation for you and me and his grace was planned before the beginning of time wasn't an afterthought wasn't a mistake it was planned he knew we'd fall and he knew we'd need a savior and he had us covered There's computer programs now that can beat the best um, chess players. And there's another Chinese game, I can't remember what it's called, Go or something. It's even more complicated than chess. And they they thought we'd never be able to create an artificial intelligence that could beat at that, but they have now. And the best players in the world will play it and can't win. And the way it works is, is it looks ahead at the variables of what the possibilities are and picks the best one. And no matter what you play, it's already like 40 plays ahead. No matter what you play, it's already picked the best thing that's most likely to win no matter what you choose. And that's just a limited computer that we created. God's mind is much more vast. And he's not guessing which might be the biggest probability of winning. He actually knows everything we're going to do. 
And he gave us this grace before time even began. But now, we didn't know about it. He hadn't told us about it. But now it's been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality. That means you never die again. To light through what? Through the gospel. Jesus came to conquer death and give us immortality. See, we had two problems. We had a sin problem. And because we all sinned, that brought about death. And so we all have a death problem. A sin problem and a death problem. And Jesus came. He died on the cross. And that dealt with our sin problem. He was buried and rose again. And that overcame our death problem. And when we put our faith in Him and obey the gospel, we receive the Holy Spirit as a down po- payment, a deposit of what's to come. And when He comes back, He's going to resurrect our bodies and we're going to get new bodies that never die. You're going to become immortal. And even though you die, Jesus said, yet shall you live. We're going to resurrect and live forever. And that's why it's called gospel. Because what's gospel mean? Good news. That's the goodest news. It couldn't get any goodester. So, we're called to this holiness. Why? Um, Hebrews, pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. If you're not holy, will you see the Lord? new you have to be holy that means you have to have your sins forgiven and you have to be living this repentant life so that forgiveness can rest upon you and so that you can see the lord you have to pursue it holiness doesn't come and zap you when chris got baptized god didn't come down and go boom you're holy now (laughs) And, and all of a sudden he never did anything wrong again. Chris has to daily pursue holiness. So do I, so do you. Holiness must be pursued. You've got to chase after it. Look at Romans 1.7. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints... Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. A saint is a person who is holy. Now in the Catholic Church I know that a saint is a person who did three miracles and was, you know, then uh, some pope declares that they're a saint and blah, blah, blah. And you know, (coughs) but that's not what a saint is. Every Christian is a saint. You're called to be holy. You're called to a holy life. You are called to be a saint and to live a sanctified or holy life. The word translated as holy just means sanctified. In, in the Greek and the Hebrew, it's the same word. Um, sanctified could be called holyfied. And you're called to a holy life, you're called to be a saint. So here it says we're called to a holy life. That's the verb. And here we're called to be saints. That's the noun. It's like saying (laughs) you're called to run and you're called to be a runner. You're called to be holy and you're, you're called to be a saint. That is your calling. I just don't know what God wants with my life. I don't know what He wants me to do. With my life. He wants you to be holy. He wants you, well, I really want to do something, you know, amazing for God. Okay. Try being holy. That's pretty rare. What if the music you listened to and the words you chose and the places you went and the movies you watched and the things you said and the jokes you told and the activities you were involved in were all holy? Well, that'd be weird. Shouldn't be, but it is. 
That's what you're called to. That's your calling. What does God want me to? He wants you to be holy. He wants you to be sacred. Set apart, different. Not normal every day. And he called us not because of anything we'd done. Look at Titus. Let's remember what Titus said. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of works we'd done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. Why did God, before time began, offer his grace and have a plan of salvation before he even started the world? Eh, because he's merciful. Because of his mercy, that's why. Look at Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it's the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. None of us get saved and are forgiven and receive the blood of Jesus because we earned it. Yeah, Jesus, you really owe me one. You better die for me. Nobody could ever say that. Nobody earned it. He, while we were yet sinners, died for us. While we were still in rebellion, while we were still being hellions, while we were still doing our own thing and being selfish, he died for us. While we were resisting him, he was still pursuing us. While we were ignoring him, he was calling us. When we were trying not to listen, he was trying to teach us. While we were refusing to drink, he was still leading a horse to water. He offered us grace. And none of us get there by our own merit. And grace because of the purpose that he had before time. It says he offered this because he had this purpose. And it was a pre-beginning of the earth purpose. Look what it says in Ephesians. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. What did he choose? I'm going to make a holy people. Before time began, he's like, I'm going to make these holy people. And look what it says in 1 Peter 1.20. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. He was, Jesus was foreordained before the foundation was laid, before he said, you know, here's the earth. Before he did that, he had foreordained what Jesus would do. God had a plan all along. Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to His purpose. God has good plans for you. And if you'll love Him and follow His calling for His purpose, it'll all work together for your good. You mean even my spouse dying? Yeah. You mean even my divorce? Uh huh. You mean even my kid's problem? Yeah. You mean even losing my job? Mm hmm. You mean even my cancer diagnosis? Yes. It's all going to work for your good. If you'll love him and you'll align yourself with his purpose, which is what? What is his purpose? To seek and save the lost. He's been planning it before he created the earth. It was his plan to create a holy people and to save some sinners. And when you choose to be a part of it, you are getting in on God's eternal plan. And it's going to win whether you choose to follow Him or not. God's plan is going to play out and work. You can choose to be a part of the success or you can pale yourself fight, uh, against it, fighting against it. You can be run over by it, or you can accept it. You can build your life on the cornerstone, or you can trip over it and become the stumbling stone to your death. But Jesus Christ, the rock, ain't moving. And he's going to do his thing, and you can be a part of it, or you can be destroyed by it. That's up to you. But he's got a plan. He laid it out before the foundation of the earth, and he's not changing it, and it's going to work. Because he's sovereign. Now, what he didn't choose before time is what choice you make. Now, he knew what choice you would make before time, but he doesn't make you choose it. There's a difference between foreknowledge and forcing you to make a decision. Now, there's some people destined for destruction. Why? Because they're going to choose to not accept him. There's some people destined for salvation. Why? Because they're going to choose to follow him by faith. But just because God knows what they're going to do and God had a plan to deal with them whatever they chose doesn't mean 
He forced their choice. You still have a choice. Whosoever will, anybody wants to, can come to him. You have the choice. So don't take these passages to mean, oh, I don't have any choice to matter. No, you do. Now he knows what it's going to be, but you still have a choice. Now, his purpose and grace are revealed, it says. This purpose isn't some mysterious thing we can't know. His grace isn't some uh, obtuse fog that we can't understand. Look at 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promises, some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Who does God want to repent? Everybody. Does everybody repent? Therefore, He must be letting who make the choice? Us. 1 Timothy 2, 4. Who desires all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth? What does God desire? What's His purpose and desire? For all people to come to a knowledge of the truth and be saved. He, God made a way for everybody to be saved. Right now, if Putin wanted to, he could come to Jesus. Right now, Putin could become a Christian. You know, God, God can, could save anybody. Um, I mean, the worst of the worst. I heard Justin Bieber became a Christian. That's proof. Um, the, uh, Revelation twenty two seventeen, And the Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let him who hears say, come. Let him who thirsts, come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. We're, our message is not, some of you aren't the elect and you're going to hell. That's not our message. The message, who's the bride, by the way? Church. What's our message? What's the bride say? He did, the bride doesn't say, not you. You're not one of us. That's not what the bride says. The bride says, come on in. Big party. Wedding party. Come on in. Everybody's welcome. Come on in. The spirit, the bride say, come. Whoever's thirsty, come. Whosoever will may come. Everybody's invited to this party. God is an equal opportunity savior. And... He's not a respecter of persons. Doesn't play favorites. He's also an equal opportunity destroyer. And if you reject him, and you're ashamed of him, and you won't confess him, watch out. Um, he destroyed death and brought immortality to light. Look at John, uh, 1 John, excuse me, 1, 2. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declared to you the eternal life which was with the Father was manifest to us. See, eternal life, we didn't know the way. How do you get to eternal life? We don't know. Who made it clear? Jesus. Jesus created a way to eternal life. John says, I write this so that you can know you are saved in 1 John. You can know. The path to eternal life is laid out. The steps, boom, 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 boom. What you need to do, boom, boom. What you need to believe, boom, boom, boom. It's all laid out. It's right there. The path to immortality has been opened, revealed. It's not hidden. It's not beyond understanding. It's not beyond comprehension. Don't leave here tonight if you don't know you're going to heaven without talking to us. We'll show you in the scripture so you can know. Don't go home and lay on your pillow and go, oh, I hope I'm going. hope I'm making it. Don't do that. If you're not sure, talk to somebody. Go home tonight knowing saved. 1 Corinthians 15, 54. So when this corruption has put on incorruption, talking about our bodies, this body is corrupted, it's dying, it's getting old, and soon I'll die. I mean, I'm way over halfway. I'm past middle aged, okay? I'm, that was... That was years ago. Jake's middle age. I'm old. <laughs> you are, brother. Sorry about your luck. Um, <laughs> and by the way, the, 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 the life expectancy of Americans for the first time in 80 years has gone down. Um, uh, so it's get, some of you all watch out. It's coming for you. Middle age is coming for you. Um, 1554. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal, that's something that dies, 
has put on immortality, that's something that won't die, then shall be brought to pass the saying that's written, death is swallowed up in victory. Is death swallowed up in victory? Not yet. You know, the, the, it says, uh, then we'll say, where, O oh, death, is your sting? Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Uh, go to the graveyard right there. I'll take you up north of Peru, and I'll show you my dad's gravestone. There's the sting. We all sat there and cried. Sting of death is still there. Some of you got loved ones and friends that are at death's door right now with sickness and disease, and it stings. It's painful. It hurts. Some of you might have ailments that you're concerned about your own mortality. And it stings. If you lose someone you des desperately love, that hurts. No, it's when Jesus comes back and we all come up out of the grave and embrace each other and know that we have immortality. That's when we'll say, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, grave, is your sting? Then the sting of death will be gone. When? When corruption has put on incorruption and mortal has put on immortality. I'm telling you, what's offered to us in the gospel of Jesus Christ is nothing short of immortality. That you can live forever in a perfect world without pain and suffering. Without hurt, without, this is my favorite part, without evil or temptation. My favorite part about heaven is going to be going Am I doing the right thing? Should I do this or should I do that? I don't know. I've got to pray about it. I won't have to do that in heaven. Everything I do will be right. And I won't be tempted. Oh, what a relief. What a relief that will be. Have no guilt, no shame, no fear, no suffering. And be loved and love in a perfect existence. That's the good news, that's the light of the gospel. That's what we're holding out. That's worth talking about. It's worth not being ashamed of. That's worth speaking about. And if they mock you, it's still worth taking their, their, their derision for their own sake. Suck it up. Be patient with them. Be kind to them. Their, their, their mortality and immortality is in the balance. He has destroyed death and brought life and immortality into light. We can see it coming. Oh, praise God, we have hope. And that is what makes us suffer without shame. Verse 11, And of this gospel I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That's why I'm suffering as I am. Why was Paul suffering? Because he was appointed a herald, an apostle, and a teacher. Because I know I, I, whom I have believed in, and I'm convinced he is able to guard what I entrusted him to that day. What did, he, what did he entrust to God? His eternal life, his soul, his salvation. I'm convinced I'm raising from the dead, so who cares what they do to me now? Who cares what they say about me? I, you know, I'm working with the comeback king. And I'm going to raise from the dead, and I'm going to overcome, and I'm going to be vindicated. You know, people are like, you know, history is not going to be kind to you. You're on the wrong side of history. Look, the people on the wrong side of history are the people that don't put their faith in Jesus. That's who's on the wrong side of history. Up in here. So, suffer without shame. He's a herald, apostle, and teacher. He herald, that's a preacher, uh, or it could be translated as town crier. But so, you know how I talked about how Peter was an elder who was an apostle? Well, Peter, or Paul is an evangelist, a preacher, who was an apostle. Okay? So he's a herald. He's a... Not like the name herald. There's some fine heralds out there, but that's not... I'm talking about a person who's a preacher, an apostle that's a messenger sent... And he's a teacher, an instructor, acknowledged for their mastery in a field of learning. So that's the definitions given to those Greek words in the Strong's Dictionary. No shame for the gospel. Why, why was he suffering? Because he was those three things. And he said, don't have any shame. 
He says uh, in 2 Timothy 1.8, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor me as prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Don't be ashamed to suffer. There's some things worth suffering for, and this is one of them. Uh, Romans 1.16, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God for salvation, for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. The gospel, it's the power of God unto salvation. Don't be ashamed of it. The gospel is, is that Jesus is the Christ. He came down. He died for our sins. He was buried. And he rose again on the third day. He's gone into heaven and someday he's going to come back and give us eternal life. That gospel that is preached, that basic gospel, is the power of God unto salvation. Don't be ashamed to say it. Be honest with yourself. Look into your heart and ask yourself, is the reason I'm not sharing the gospel with people is because I'm ashamed? And if you are, be ashamed of being ashamed. And don't let being ashamed stop you. It's the, is, it, is it save you? Is it true or not? Is Jesus a real person or not? Did he live and walk on the earth or didn't he? Figure it out. Did he die for you or not? Is he the son of God or isn't he? Was he buried and rose again? Is it true or is it not? If it's true, stop being ashamed of it. Is he coming back someday to offer salvation to those who put their faith in him? Or isn't he? If it's true, if you believe it, and if you've accepted it, and you know it's true, stop being ashamed to tell people about it. Stop acting like it's not the center of your life. It's not the most important news that ever needs to be told. And it's not the number one thing you need to talk to your family, friends, and strangers about. And especially to your enemies. There should be no shame. Is it true or isn't it? Well then stop being ashamed of it. Stop being a scaredy cat. Stop being a wimp. It's the most important news in the world. Stop hiding it. Stop being ashamed of the most beautiful, wonderful truth ever espoused. Stop being ashamed of Jesus and hiding that you're a Christian. Because someday, if you're ashamed of him, he's going to be ashamed of you. And he knows you can't hide this stuff from him. And he's able to guard. Paul says, I am convinced he's able to guard what I've entrusted him. Look what it says in uh, 1 Peter 4, 19. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. What should the sufferer entrust to God? I'm going to be all right. They're persecuting me. I'm going to be all right. I lost my job. I'm going to be all right. I lost my friend. I'm going to be all right. My parents won't talk to me. I'm going to be all right. My spouse is mad at me. I'm going to be all right. They're making fun of me on the internet. I'm going to be all right. He is able to guard what you entrust to him. So give him your soul. Entrust to him your future, your destiny, your eternity, your purpose, your meaning, your life. Entrust it to him. Your dreams, your future, your relationships. Entrust it all in. Put it all in his hands. Know who you can trust in this world. Can you trust Jesus? Can you trust Donald Trump? Can you trust Joe Biden? Can you trust Putin? Can you trust any? Can you trust the news? Can you, tr can you trust the politician? Who can you trust? Can you even trust yourself sometimes? Who can you trust? Who should you put in care of your soul and your eternity and your destiny? Jesus Christ. And when you do that, you won't be afraid to suffer. Because if you're suffering for Him, He must have good reason. Must mean someone's going to get saved from it. Must mean it's going to make me a better person. Must be something I need to grow and to learn must be a lesson I need to teach. Must be an example I need to set. Must be glory I need to bring to Jesus' name. There must be something going on because I know who I believed in and I am persuaded that He is able to keep what I've given to Him until that day. 2 Timothy 4, 8. Henceforth, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord 
The righteous judge will award to me on that day. Not only to me, but all who have loved his appearing. Mm. There's a reward that makes suffering worth it. There's a person I can trust that makes suffering not as scary. There's a person who before the foundation of the earth was laid had a plan for me and for salvation and for my life. So I don't need to be worried about what's going on on the news. Because he knew it all in advance. And he's got a plan. And it's for your good. If you love Him and you're called according to His purpose, it's for your eternal good. And for everyone else who loves Him and is called according to His purpose. It's for their good. So we don't got to be ashamed of anything. And we don't have to be afraid. And we don't have to live in fear about what they're going to do if we stand up for Jesus. The only thing you ought to fear is is what God's going to do if you don't. Don't be afraid of the one who can kill your body. Be afraid of the one who can take your body and your soul and cast them into hell. The beginning of wisdom is to fear the Lord. We will pick up at 2 Timothy 1 13 next week.